Section 3. 40. The ancients, wishing to exhibit to us the peculiarity of incorporeal being, so far as this can be affected by words, when they assert that it is one, immediately add that it is likewise all things, by which they signify that it is not some one of things which are known by the senses. Since, however, we suspect that this incorporeal one is different from sensibles, in consequence of not perceiving this total one, which is in all things according to one in a sensible nature, and which is so because this one is all things. Hence, the ancients added that it is one so far as one, in order that we might understand that what is all things in truly existing being is something uncompounded, and that we might withdraw ourselves from the conception of coacervation. When, likewise, they say that it is everywhere, they add that it is nowhere. When, also, they assert that it is in all things, they add that it is nowhere in everything. Thus, too, when they say that it is in all things and in every divisible nature which is adapted to receive it, they add that it is a whole in a whole. And, in short, they render it manifest to us through contrary peculiarities, at one and the same time assuming these, in order that we may exterminate from the apprehension of it the fictitious conceptions which are derived from bodies, and which obscure the cognoscible peculiarities of real being. 41. When you have assumed an eternal essence, infinite in itself, according to power, and begin to perceive intellectually a hypostasis unwearied, untamed, and never failing, but transcending in the most pure and genuine life, and full from itself, and which is likewise established in itself, satisfied with and seeking nothing but itself, to this essence, if you add a subsistence in place, or a relation to a certain thing, at the same time that you appear to diminish it by ascribing to it an indigence of place, or a relative condition of being, you do not in reality diminish this essence, but you separate yourself from the perception of it by receiving as a veil the fantasy which runs under your conjectural apprehension of it. For you cannot pass beyond, or stop, or render more perfect, or affect the least change in a thing of this kind, because it is impossible for it to be in the smallest degree deficient. For it is much more never failing than any perpetually flowing fountain can be conceived to be. If, however, you are unable to keep pace with it, and to become assimilated to the intelligible all, you should not investigate anything pertaining to real being. Or if you do, you will deviate from the path that leads to it, and will look to something else. But if you investigate nothing else, being established in yourself and your own essence, you will be assimilated to the intelligible universe, and will not adhere to anything posterior to it. Neither, therefore, should you say, I am of great magnitude. For omitting greatness, you will become universal, though you were universal prior to this. But together with the universal, something else was present with you, and you became less by the addition, because the addition was not from truly existing being. For to that you cannot add anything. When, therefore, anything is added from non-being, a place is afforded to poverty, an associate, accompanied by an indigence of all things. Hence, dismissing non-being you will become sufficient to yourself. For he will not return properly to himself who does not dismiss things of a more vile and abject nature, and who opines himself to be something naturally small, and not to be such as he truly is. For thus he, at one and the same time, departs both from himself and from truly existing being. When, also, any one is present with that which is present in himself, then he is present with true being, which is everywhere. But, when you withdraw from yourself, then likewise you recede from real being. Of such great consequence is it for a man to be present with that which is present within himself, 
i.e. with his rational part, and to be absent from that which is external to him. If, however, true being is present with us, but non-being is absent, and real being is not present with us in conjunction with other things of a nature foreign to it, it does not accede in order that it may be present, but we depart from it when it is not present with things of a different nature. And why should this be considered as wonderful? For you, when present, are not absent from yourself, and yet you are not present with yourself, though present, and you are both present with and absent from yourself when you survey other things, and omit to behold yourself. If, therefore, you are thus present, and yet not in reality present with yourself, and on this account you are ignorant of yourself, and in a greater degree discover all things, though remote from your essence, other than yourself, with which you are naturally present, why should you wonder if that which is not present is remote from you, who are remote from it, because you have become remote from yourself? For by how much the more you are truly present with yourself, though it is present and inseparably conjoined with you, by so much the more you will be present with real being, which is so essentially united to you, that it is as impossible for it to be divulsed from you as for you to be separated from yourself, so that it is universally possible to know what is present with real being and what is absent from it, though it is everywhere present, and again also nowhere. For those who are able to proceed into their own essence intellectually and obtain knowledge of it will, in the knowledge itself, and the science accompanying this knowledge be able to recover or regain themselves through the union of that which knows with that which is known. And with those who are present with themselves, truly existing being will also be present. But from such as abandon the proper being of themselves to other things, from these as they are absent from themselves, true being will also be absent. If, however, we are naturally adapted to be established in the same essence, to be rich from ourselves, and not to descend to that which we are not, in so doing, becoming in want of ourselves, and thus associating with poverty, though porous or plenty is present, and if we are cut off from real being, from which we are not separated either by place or essence nor by anything else, through our conversion to non-being, we suffer as a just punishment of our abandonment of true being, a departure from and ignorance of ourselves. And again, by a proper attention, we recover ourselves and become united to divinity. It is therefore rightfully said that the soul is confined in the body as in a prison and is detained in chains like a fugitive slave. We should, however, earnestly endeavor to be liberated from our bonds, for through being converted to these sensible objects, we desert ourselves, though we are of a divine origin and are, as Empedocles says, heaven's exiles straying from the orb of light. So that every depraved life is full of servitude, and on this account is without from God and unjust the spirit in it being full of impiety, and consequently of injustice. And thus, again, it is rightfully said that justice is to be found in the performance of that which is the province of him who performs it. The image, also, of true justice consists in distributing to each of those with whom we live that which is due to the desert of each. 42. That which possesses its existence in another, i.e. in something different from itself, and is not essentialized in itself, separately from another, if it should be converted to itself in order to know itself, without that in which it is essentialized, withdrawing itself from it would be corrupted by this knowledge in consequence of separating itself from its essence. But that which is able to know itself without the subject in which it exists, 
and is able to withdraw itself from this subject without destruction of itself cannot be essentialized in that from which it is capable of converting itself to itself without being corrupted and of knowing itself by its own energies. Hence, if sight and every sensitive power neither perceives itself nor apprehends or preserves itself by separating itself from body, but intellect, when it separates itself from body, then especially perceives intellectually, is converted to itself and is not corrupted. It is evident that the sensitive powers obtain the power of energizing through the body, but intellect possesses its energies and its essence not in body, but in itself. 43. Incorporeal natures are properly denominated and conceived to be what they are according to a privation of body, just as according to the ancients matter and the form which is in matter and also the natures and physical powers are apprehended by an abstraction from matter, and after this same manner place, time, and the boundaries of things are apprehended. For all such things are denominated according to a privation of body. There are likewise other things which are said to be incorporeal improperly, not according to a privation of body, but in short because they are not naturally adapted to generate body. Hence those of the former signification subsist in bodies, but those of the second are perfectly separated from bodies, and from those incorporeal natures which subsist about bodies. For bodies indeed are in place, and boundaries are in body, but intellect and intellectual reason neither subsist in place nor in body, nor proximately give existence to bodies, nor subsist together with bodies, or with those incorporeal natures which are denominated according to a privation of bodies. Neither, therefore, if a certain incorporeal vacuum should be conceived to exist, would it be possible for intellect to be in a vacuum. For a vacuum may be the recipient of body, but it is impossible that it should be the recipient of intellect, and afford a place for its energy, since, however, the genus of an incorporeal nature appears to be twofold. One of these, the followers of Zeno, do not at all admit, but they adopt the other. And perceiving that the former is not such as the latter, they entirely subvert it. Though they ought rather to conceive that it is another genus, and not to fancy that, because it is not the latter, it has no existence. 44. Intellect and the intelligible are one thing, and sense and that which is sensible another, and the intelligible indeed is conjoined with intellect, but that which is sensible with sense. Neither, however, can sense by itself apprehend itself, but the intelligible, which is conjoined with intellect, and intellect, which is conjoined with the intelligible, by no means fall under the perception of sense. Intellect, however, is intelligible to intellect, but if intellect is the intelligible object of intellect, intellect will be its own intelligible object. If, therefore, intellect is an intellectual and not a sensible object, it will be intelligible. But if it is intelligible to intellect and not to sense, it will also be intelligent. The same thing, therefore, will be that which is intelligent or intellectually perceives and that which is intellectually perceived or is intelligible. And this will be true of the whole with respect to the whole, but not as he who rubs and he who is rubbed. Intellect, therefore, does not intellectually perceive by one part and is intellectually perceived by another, for it is impartable and the whole is an intelligible object of the whole. It is likewise wholly intellect, having nothing in itself which can be conceived to be deprived of intelligence. 
Hence, one part of it does not intellectually perceive, but not another part of it. For so far as it does not intellectually perceive, it will be unintelligent. Neither, therefore, departing from this thing, does it pass on to that. For of that from which it departs, it has no intellectual perception. But if there is no transition in its intellections, it intellectually perceives all things at once. If, therefore, it understands all things at once, and not this thing now, but another afterwards, it understands all things instantaneously and always. Hence, if all things are instantaneously perceived by it, its perceptions have nothing to do with the past and the future, but subsist in an indivisible, untemporal now, so that the simultaneous, both according to the multitude and according to the temporal interval, is present with intellect. Hence, too, all things subsist in it according to one and in one, without interval and without time. But if this be the case, there is nothing discursive or transitive in its intellections, and consequently they are without motion. Hence, they are energies according to one, subsisting in one without increase or mutation or any transition. If, however, the multitude subsists according to one, and the energy is collected together at once and without time, an essence of this kind must necessarily always subsist in an intelligible one. But this is eternity. Hence, eternity is present with intellect. That nature, however, which does not perceive intellectually according to one, and in one but trans transitively and with motion, so that in understanding it leaves one thing and apprehends another, divides and proceeds discursively, this nature, which is soul, subsists in conjunction with time. For with a motion of this kind, the future and past are consubsistent. But soul, changing its conceptions, passes from one thing to another. Not that the prior conceptions depart and the posterior accede in their place, but there is, as it were, a transition of the former, though they remain in the soul, and the latter accede, as if from some other place. They do not, however, accede in reality from another place, but they appear to do so in consequence of the self-motion of the soul, and through her eye being directed to a survey of the different forms which she contains, and which have relation of parts to her whole essence. For she resembles a fountain not flowing outwardly, but circularly scattering its streams into itself. With the motion, therefore, of the soul, time is consubsistent, but eternity is consubsistent with the permanency of intellect in itself. It is not, however, divided from intellect in the same manner as time is from the soul, because in intellect the consubsistent essences are united, but that which is perpetually moved is the source of false opinion of eternity. Through the immeasurable extent of its motion producing a conception of eternity, and that which abides in one is falsely conceived to be the same as that which is perpetually moved. For that which is perpetually moved evolves the time of itself in the same manner as the now of itself and multiplies it according to a temporal progression. Hence some have apprehended that time is to be surveyed in permanency no less than in motion, and that eternity, as we have said, is infinite time, just as if each of these imparted its own properties to the other, time, which is always moved, adumbrating eternity by the perpetuity of itself, and the sameness of its motion, and eternity, through being established in sameness of energy, becoming similar to time, by the permanency of itself arising from energy. In sensibles, however, the time of one thing is distinct from that of another. Thus, for instance, there is one time of the sun, and another of the moon, and one time of the morning star, and another of each of the planets. Hence, 
also there is a different year of different planets. The year, likewise, which comprehends these times, terminates as in a summit in the motion of the soul of the universe. According to the imitation of which the celestial orbs are moved. The motion of the soul, however, being of a different nature from that of the planets, the time of the former also different from that of the latter. For the latter subsists in interval and is distinguished from the former by local motions and transitions.